Amen. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we just thank you today. We thank you for the day of Pentecost. Uh, we thank you, Lord God, that you are in this place. And uh, God, we just ask that you would just continue to move, to breathe, to speak, uh, Lord, through the preaching of the word. We ask that you would ignite faith all across this room, uh, that our lives would be transformed, our minds would be renewed, uh, that chains would break, Lord God. We would receive a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit and fire and uh, Lord that our lives will be forever upended for the gospel of Jesus Christ so God we honor you we bless you and we magnify your holy name in Jesus name we pray amen, amen. and amen uh, if you have your Bibles you can turn with me to Luke chapter 22 we're going to start here we're going to take a little bit of a journey <coughs> And I'm going to start at verse 31 and read to 34, and then we'll jump down to verse 54 and 62 through 62. Amen. When you have it, just say, I got it. I got it. Amen. It says this. Uh, this is Jesus speaking. Uh, this is uh, right after the disciples, they're arguing over who is going to be the greatest uh, and Jesus tells them that if you want to be the greatest, you have to be like a little child. You have to be the one who serves. Uh, and then he turns to Peter uh, and he says this, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Uh, we can jump down to verse 54 uh, because Jesus gets handed over to be crucified. Uh, and then this is what happens. It says, then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. This is talking about Jesus. Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you are talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Hallelujah. Amen. The word of the Lord. Um, you may be wondering why I'm reading those passages today on the day of Pentecost. Uh, and I actually plan to give, a, a, I guess you could say, a normal Pentecost message about how Jesus, he promised the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, it was promised even as uh, John the Baptist was baptizing. He said, there's another one who comes after me uh, whose sandals I'm unworthy to untie. Uh, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And Jesus said, it's better that I leave because then I can send another one like me, uh, the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so Jesus, he actually sent the promised Holy Spirit after he ascended into heaven on the day of Pentecost to empower his people to be his witnesses. It's for every single believer. The initial physical evidence, as we see throughout the book of Acts, is speaking in unknown or other tongues. Uh, and then at the end, which we are going to do, uh, we're going to pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Pray that Jesus will baptize us in the Holy Spirit and fire. Uh, and this is going to happen because it's the will of God. Uh, people will be transformed today. Minds will be renewed. Uh, bodies healed, delivered, set free from bondage and all the power of the devil. Uh, that is the will of God. Uh, and I wanted to preach that message. But as I was praying uh, over this message, as I was praying over you, I began to see something else. Uh, because Pentecost is many things to us. 
Most notably, it's the birthing of the church, the capital C church. Uh, it's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and fire. It's the fulfillment of the Joel chapter 2 prophecy, which says, In the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Uh, it was the start of the end times or the time period between Jesus ascending and the, uh, Jesus returning to the earth. But also, we get a very, very real picture of the grace, the mercy, and the redemption of God at Pentecost. We see redemption in Pentecost. We see the redeeming power of God at the day of Pentecost. Pentecost is not only the birthing of the church, but it's a message of hope and restoration. And I want to talk about three things I believe that this passage and the passages in Acts that we'll see shows us about Jesus and his desire for us, how he handles us even at our very lowest points in life. This is what Jesus does. Jesus restores, Jesus empowers, and Jesus sends. Jesus restores, Jesus empowers, and Jesus sends. The day of Pentecost is a reminder that there is always a before and an after in Christ. That even in your lowest moments, at the times of despair, at the times where you've given up, maybe you're hopeless and you're depressed, maybe you've decided to deny Jesus for other things, uh, but Jesus has not given up on you. And we see this in the life of Peter because he starts out in this passage denying Jesus three times. And by the time we get to the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit is poured out upon him. And he's standing up boldly proclaiming the message of the Messiah, a before and an after. Jesus will never leave you this the same way. He will never leave you at your lowest moment in your life. He will never leave you at your greatest distance that you feel from him. He will always desire restoration for your life. Yes. Always. Always and forever. You may change. The situation may change. The season may change. But Jesus Christ does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the day of Pentecost is such a reminder that there's always a before and an after in Jesus. So I don't know what your lowest moment is. I don't know if you've been denying Jesus for the gratification of your flesh and other pleasures, but I'm telling you today that Jesus will not leave you there. He will not leave you in that pit. He died and he paid too much with his own blood to leave you at your lowest moment. I'm telling you, on the day of Pentecost, Peter, he stood up and he proclaimed boldly before thousands of people and he saw them be saved and come into Christ when just before that, a couple weeks before, he denied them before, he denied Jesus before one little slave girl. He went from denying Jesus before a little girl to standing and proclaiming boldly the message of the gospel before thousands of people. Amen. The Holy Spirit, the day of Pentecost, the outpouring of God's spirit, the fire of God is meant to take us from before to an after. To take us from our lowest point, the valley, to the mountaintop that Jesus can empower us and use us and send us out to be witnesses for him in the earth. Jesus restores. Turn with me to John chapter 21. Jesus has risen from the dead at this point and he uh, appears to the disciples a number of times. And, 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 and at this time, they're out on the Sea of Galilee again. Uh, the disciples of Jesus, many of them that he called, they were fishermen and they left families, homes and jobs uh, uh, to be with Jesus, to walk with him. And so you can imagine what they felt as Jesus was led away and crucified on that cross as all their hopes and their dreams of the Messiah restoring the land, the nation of Israel before they were occupied by the Romans and, uh, and before that given over to the Babylonians and all of them, that they were waiting on their Messiah to restore the nation of Israel and then he dies. Then he dies. After they denied him, after they abandoned him. So not only did the Messiah die, but they abandoned him right before that. And they're in deep despair in this moment. But Jesus comes to them. He visits them while they've gone back to what they knew before Jesus. While they're on the boat fishing and doing what they always knew before they met Jesus. He comes to them. He appears to them and reveals himself to them. Verse 4, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? 
know the answer. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. It was so bad, they went back to what they always knew how to do and they couldn't even get any fish. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you just caught. So Simon Peter climbed into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, he took the bread and he gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. See, Peter had denied Jesus three times. And then Jesus has a message of restoration to Peter three times. He denied him three times, but Jesus has a message of restoration to Peter three times. This is, <laughs> they're back to life as normal. They're sad. They're fishing, they're not catching anything, and Jesus shows up, but he doesn't show up to condemn them. He doesn't show up to say, y'all abandoned me, you left me behind. You know what he does? He says, let's have a meal. This is real relationship, because that's what they did when they walked with Jesus those three years. They would go out and they do the work of the ministry. They heal the sick, cast out devils, and then they would sit down and they would share a meal together. This is real relationship that Jesus has with these disciples and it's real relationship that he has with all of us. Mm -hmm. See, when Jesus comes to restore, uh, he's not coming or you may think he's coming to visit you and you know, it's like, oh, I'm scared to talk to Jesus. I don't even wanna look at him. Jesus, there's no way you can come near me. If you knew what I've been doing, if you knew how I've been speaking, if you knew how I've been acting, if you could remember that just a couple weeks before I denied you and I ran away as they seized you to be crucified, there's no way you would come out on this boat with me. But Jesus doesn't even bring it up. He doesn't even bring up what they did. He helps them. He lends them a hand catching some fish. And then he sits down and he eats with them. In Revelation, he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if you open the door, he wants to come in and eat with you. This is real relationship. This is real relationship. It's not easily broken. It's not something that's fickle, that's here today and just gone with the wind. Jesus is a man of real relationship. He died and he loves us too much to just throw us away. Does that make sense? The grace of God. Is Jesus doing this, our lowest point? Because I think Jesus needs them to know, and I think it's written for us to know as well, that Jesus isn't just out here abandoning us even when we've abandoned him. He is faithful even when we're faithless. That's what the Bible says. He's still faithful. Our faithlessness does not move his faithfulness. Our lack of, of, of care and concern our, 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 our lifestyles that we're living, the things that we say, the things that we do, do not move the hand of Jesus Christ. It doesn't move him. It doesn't change him. It doesn't shake him. He's not on his throne in heaven like, oh my God, they did it again. Jesus is unshakable. Yeah. And that's good news that we have a God who doesn't change with the seasons. Yeah. It's good news that we have a God who we can put our stake in, yeah. who's firm, who's solid, yeah. even when we are not. Yeah. Yeah. The God who restores, 
the God who transforms. <laughs> you know, and, and, and it's, it's interesting because they were arguing about who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And then all of a sudden they fled and they abandoned him. They were always like that. It just took the right circumstance for it to come out of them. But Jesus knew all things. The yeah. Bible says that. He's God in the flesh. He knew all things. Yeah. And he still chose them knowing that they would run away and abandon him and deny him. He chose them before they did it. Yeah. And then when they did it, he wasn't surprised. Remember, he says, Satan has asked to sit with you as we. Yeah. And when you turn back, that means you're going to turn away. And when you turn back, yeah. strengthen your brothers. He knows it. He knew it from before the foundations of the world. Exactly what was going to happen. But he still chose not the strongest people. Not the ones who are going to stand there and fight and, and, and be like, y'all not taking Jesus. He chose the ones who are weak. The ones who run away. The ones who yap like the little Boston Terriers. They got a big yap. And when it comes down to it, they're running away from the fight. He chose them. And this is good news, because if we had a Bible that all you saw was these amazing heroic stories, they're super strong, they never waver, you know, nothing stops them, nothing can get in their way, they're always on mission, they're always focused, and nothing, and no one can stop them. We have a problem. I have a problem, because there's no way I can live up to that. But all throughout the Bible, you know what you see? You see people who make these amazing blunders. You see people who are off the wall crazy. People who are thrown off from the start of their life to the very end of their life. And yes, they serve as examples. It's not to say, hey, they did it. You can do it too. But I think it's so God can show us the humanness of us all. And that he can still take the mess that we've created and make something beautiful out of it. He still can do that. My mess, your mess, all the things that we've done, all the ways that we've, all the decisions that we've made that were not for Jesus Christ. He can still take our lives and turn them around and mold them and shape them into something beautiful. He restores us even at our lowest and our worst moments. He's a faithful God. Have you gone back? <laughs> Maybe you've gone to what you previously knew. Maybe you've gone back to the worst mistakes or just the life that, you know, is just, hey, you know, I'm doing it without Jesus. I got to do it on my own strength. But the worst mistake we can do is in these low points to not let Jesus in. He's not standing at the door knocking to rain down this fiery judgment on us. He just wants to share a meal. He wants to sup. See, because when we sit down with him, when we invite him in, when we share a meal with Jesus, we get to know his true heart. And it's the heart of God that really transforms us to be able to live for him. It's not a set of rules and regulations. Do this. Don't do that. You better not do that. It's not a set of rules and regulations because you can do all those things. But I've known some people who follow all of the rules, but inside they are wicked. And Jesus called the Pharisees whitewashed tombs. They look good on the outside, but inside is dead bones. I don't want to be that. I don't want to be that. I don't want to be that. I would, I, would, I would rather be open with my lowest moments yeah. and invite Jesus yeah. Yeah. into that yeah. Yeah. than pretend like everything is all together come on, come and then on, I actually on. limit the hand of God to yeah. use me. Yeah. I want to be used by Jesus. I want to always be able to be restored to the Lord Jesus Christ because that is his desire for all of us. Yeah. Pentecost shows us just how important that restoration is to God. Pentecost shows us that God truly is not like man. He doesn't just throw us away. He doesn't just kick us while we're down. He actually draws near to us when we want to run away from him. Isn't that something? Pentecost shows us there really is a before and an after in Christ. It's easy to say it. But we get a, a, a real picture. It's yeah. easy to say, hey, in Christ your sins are forgiven. They're washed away. The past is dead and gone. No, we see literally a couple weeks difference the past is completely gone in Peter's life. 
The denial of Jesus three times is completely washed away by the forgiveness of Christ. That's what Pentecost shows us. Jesus empowers. Uh, if you go to Acts chapter 1, 1 through 8, it says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. And then we see Acts chapter 2. Verse 1 through 4, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Jesus said it was better that he leaves because he would send the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is not constrained by physical location. Jesus, as he walked the earth, God in the flesh, he was limited by physicality. If he was in one location, he couldn't be in another. But the Holy Spirit indwells every single believer, wherever they are in the world. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of you. Um, and if all we got was forgiveness, that would be great. Uh, but we get God's spirit dwelling on the inside of us. He comforts us. He leads us. He guides us into all truth. He convicts us. He teaches us. He trains us. And if all we got was the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that would also be amazing. Come on, somebody. <laughs> but I'm telling you, every single believer can receive the promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's not a salvation thing. It doesn't mean you're not saved, right? But it's just the gift to the believer. Salvation is the gift to the unbeliever and the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the gift to the believer. And this is what it's for. It's so that you can be empowered to witness for Jesus. And this doesn't just mean going up to random people on the street, but empowered to live a life consecrated to him, to live a transformed life. So we were, uh, Miss Joyce was telling us a story on Mother's Day. And she said she went to work one day and all of a sudden a woman came up to her and she said, Miss Joyce, can you pray for me, please? And in that moment, I thought, I said, man, how would she know who to go to when she had a need? Yeah. Come on. Because Miss Joyce is living her life as a witness yeah. Yeah. for Jesus. It doesn't mean that she's shouting down, got a microphone on the corner. Look, we've done that. Amen. It's good. It does not mean that. But she is living her life out loud as a witness for Jesus Christ. It's not only in word, but it is definitely in word. But it's also in deed. We don't want to be people who just speak and our life is not transformed. It's both. The Holy Spirit transforms both our speech and our actions. Amen. So Peter went from denying Jesus. And then he's boldly proclaiming Jesus to thousands in Acts chapter 2. It says he stood up all of a sudden and he began to proclaim to them. After Jesus restores you, he wants to empower you to be a witness for him. To spread his name across your spheres of influences. He redeems you and then he gives you everything you need to work on his behalf. Listen, if a job fires you, if you quit in a bad way, it's going to follow you around. If you commit a crime, you go to jail, that record is going to follow you around. And it's a lot harder to find work or anything due to that. But Jesus, he's the one who will wipe the slate clean and then call you to work for him anyway. Come on, because love keeps no record of wrongs. 
Love keeps no record of wrong. See, it's one thing, uh, you know, you do something against your job to not have charges pressed against you. Hallelujah. It's another thing to get your job back, you know. Uh, but it's something otherworldly to move into an executive position at a company that you did completely wrong. And this is what Jesus does. He takes us when we've denied him, when we've acted all kinds of crazy, when we've chosen ourselves over him over and over and over again. And he cleans our record. He calls us to come and work for him. And he places us with authority in his name. That's what Jesus does. He restores us and he empowers us so we can be sent out and transform the world in his name. It's amazing that Jesus Christ would trust us. Come on, somebody. Listen, it is amazing that Jesus Christ would entrust us with this glorious gospel. I'm telling you, it is amazing. You know, (laughs) It, it's amazing to me. It's amazing. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's, you know, people say, oh, you know, people are inherently good. People are always good. If you've met even a toddler, listen, you know people People are selfish. People. Are, if you think about your own life, people are selfish. People are crazy. I'm telling you, we need Jesus. We need his Holy Spirit. <laughs> And even though we have not fully arrived, we will never arrive until the day he returns or until we die. We will not uh, have the full perfection that he's promised us. We walk it out day by day in a process called sanctification, but still he entrusts us to spread his message. He entrusts us to share about Jesus, to share the gospel, the good news that Jesus died on the cross and he rose from the grave and our sins can be forgiven, not only forgiven, but removed from us and we can be in right relationship with God. That is amazing to me. They went from cowardice to courageousness. They were afraid of suffering. And then later on in Acts, they were rejoicing over being persecuted. They went from 120 gathered in a room to thousands. They watched Jesus do ministry. And now they're discipling other people in the way. The main purpose of the spirit baptism is to empower believers to carry out the work of Jesus in the earth. He said, you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses. It is only by the power of the Holy Spirit that you see such a great transformation. Overnight transformation. It wasn't thousands of years later where Peter's finally got the stain off of his record. It was a couple weeks after that that he's standing up boldly proclaiming Jesus. The Great Commission. Jesus said we must go out. Disciple the nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit empowers the church to tangibly express Jesus to the world. We're supposed to be the hands and feet of Jesus, the literal hands and feet. What would Jesus do if he were here? That is what we are supposed to do. We're supposed to be the hands and feet of Jesus and do what he would do if he were still here on the earth. We have a great responsibility to carry out in this supernatural work, and it cannot be fulfilled to its fullness without supernatural power. It cannot without supernatural power. It's not to sit around and do nothing. It's not to speak in tongues and no action. It is for souls and the transformation of society. Hallelujah. Jesus sins. Come on. Uh, The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not just for the first few thousand believers on the day of Pentecost. Uh, It's the pattern that we see throughout the book of Acts. Uh, Acts chapter 2, they uh, were baptized in the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in tongues. Uh, Later on, it says they were praying. The place was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit again. uh, Acts chapter 10, uh, the believers, they get filled with the Holy Spirit. They speak in tongues. Acts chapter 19, the same thing. They get filled with the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues. It empowered the believers to shake up the world around them. Come on, somebody. They didn't do this by force in in the ancient Roman world. Uh, They didn't hold anyone at gunpoint. They lived their lives out loud as witnesses in word and in deed. Uh, And and society was literally transformed by the disciples. 
They would go into towns and they would preach Jesus and they would say, listen, you're, you're, you're making these gods out of wood and stone. Like you made the God that you're serving. That doesn't make sense. No, there's one God and he, he created all things serving. And it would cause uproars throughout cities. And they went around and they shared the gospel and thousands and thousands and thousands were being saved. They had people burning witchcraft paraphernalia uh, uh, and it was worth tons of money and they freely burned it. Because of the gospel of Jesus Christ to transform the world. They didn't do it by force. They didn't hold anyone at gunpoint. It was the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. And it's no different today. Jesus wants to send you out in your own sphere of influence. Uh, you know, uh, they didn't just stay put in Jerusalem. Uh, as you can see, we're here in America right now. So the gospel did not stay there. Jesus sent them out and he does the same thing with us in our spheres of influence, in our families, in our workplaces, our friends. We must be people who share the good news about Jesus. Every single person that's a believer in Jesus Christ is sent to that sphere of influence to impact the world for Jesus. Every single one. There is no one exempt. It may look different. You don't have to look like me. I don't have to look like you when I do it. But every single believer is called to impact the world for Jesus. Yeah. Come on. Amen. 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 God is faithful uh, and he is true. I want you to know this. Uh, Jesus is a restorer. Jesus is really a restorer. He really is. And he doesn't just leave it up to you and say, hey, look, you're restored, figure it out. No, he empowers us to live a restored life. He sends the Holy Spirit. Uh, and I want to call you up right now. We're going to pray um, in a little bit. Uh, yeah, we're going to pray. And we want to pray for everybody who wants prayer today. Amen. Um, anyone who wants prayer, we want to pray for you. We want to stand with you. We want to believe God for you. Uh, if you feel like you need the restoration of God, uh, if you want to experience his forgiveness, if you, uh, you know, feel like, you know, I, I've been at my lowest point, I've turned back, or, you know, maybe you've never met the Lord before. Uh, I want to pray for you. We want to stand with you and believe God to restore you uh, because he's not just going to restore you. He's going to empower you and he's going to send you out in his name. And you'll look back and you'll say, man, I can't believe that where I was in my life, all the things that I've done, Jesus literally washed them clean. Jesus literally took me and he forgave me. And the only one who's bringing up my old sins is the devil and my flesh. It's not him anymore because it's completely washed clean. And now he wants to use me for his glory. That's amazing. So if you could just stand with me real quick. We're going to believe God for restoration. Maybe you're feeling hopeless. Maybe you're in despair. Maybe you feel far from God. Maybe you've been living wildly lately and you need the Lord to restore you. You need assurance that the Lord Jesus still loves you and cares for you. We want to pray for you right now. Amen. Hallelujah. And if that's you and you're watching online, just put in the chat, just put restoration. We want to pray for you and stand with you and believe God for you. Hallelujah. If that's anybody in here, just raise your hand across the room. Hallelujah. That anybody in here, the restoration of God for your life. Amen. Hallelujah. We're going to call you up in just a moment. And if you want to be empowered, and maybe you want to answer both, if you want to be empowered, you, you believe, you've given your life to Jesus. You want to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. We're going to make a call for that as well so you can receive this baptism. It's different from, it's subsequent to salvation, but it's for impact so that you can be a witness to the world. And it is essential 
to living the fullness of the life as a believer. Hallelujah. If you raise your hand for restoration, I want you to just come to the front now. We're going to pray for you and stand with you. We're going to believe God for your life. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we honor you in this place. God, we exalt you in this place. We thank you for those, Lord God. We thank you for those, Lord God, who need the restoration, who need to experience it and encounter it in Jesus' name. Prince, you can go ahead and start praying. Hallelujah. And if you didn't answer the call and you just want to stand with your brothers and sisters, you can pray for them that they would experience and encounter the restoration, the forgiveness of God. Hallelujah. But we honor you in this place. We 